okay. thing. Okie dokie. All right, so it's one o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. I just wanted to uh, thank Noel Wixom and Brad Steele for being with us today. Um, Noel is the founder of CC Tech Partners. It's a technology consulting uh, company for clubs, and Brad Steele is the founder of Private Club Consultants, um, which helps clubs with legal and operational uh, issues. So they are going to give us a presentation today on IT and legal best practices for reopening your club. Uh, without further ado, I am going to pass it over to Noel and Brad. Well, thank you, Kate. Noel, I'll let you kick it all off as we, as we go down this fun and exciting road. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you everybody for joining us. And you know, what we wanted to do was kind of give the, you know, some of the CMA chapters across the country um, kind of a view into what are some of the challenges, you know, reopening a club during COVID-19. And so we heard from a number of chapters and um, I had seen Brad um, uh, speak at uh, a couple of the other chapters of, and, and some of these OSHA issues. And then I thought it was very interesting, you know, on some of the challenges just, you know, from, you know, regardless of being a private club of, you know, opening, you know, this a business back up. And so I reached out and contacted him and said, you know, it's funny because I'm working with, you know, general managers across the country since April on, uh, Kate, you want to move to the next couple slides on the learning objectives? You know, what would be some good learning objectives for this session? And so, you know, Brad's going to talk about the OSHA guidelines and what we saw, you know, four or five weeks ago um, was that general managers started asking like, you know, how do we take temperatures? How do we, you know, what sort of, you know, process can we put in place to protect our staff and members? So if you could go to the next slide. You know, this education session came about was, you know, as the GMs started reaching out to me, I saw Brad's session and thought, why don't we put something together that talks about OSHA and the ability for clubs to at least have some sort of metric to measure if their staff was um, healthy or sick. And, you know, there's no silver bullet in this, but it's just some sort of, um, you know, tool to help us better manage the club. And, you know, it's some of those OSHA requirements of you have to create a work surface, well, uh, safe workplace. Well, how do you do that when you have this disease that, you know, I would have never thought that IT and, you know, OSHA would be in the same sentence, but boy, they are today. So with that being said, I'll pass it over to Brad to talk about some of the OSHA challenges. Well, it's going to be an interesting time to say the least, and I, I certainly know this, that as I've gone through the process of speaking to chapters and general managers and leaders in the industry for, uh, for the last month or so, there are a lot of things that we have to do to understand that while our members are champing at the bit to get back at the, the club, you all have to make sure that, in essence, you're ready and capable of doing what you need to do before you open. There are, as I say, federal and state requirements that we all must follow. Now, obviously, for the, the three or four states that, uh, that the uh, National Capital Chapter is representing, you've got different requirements. But certainly living in the Commonwealth of Virginia uh, and working with DC clubs and certain Maryland clubs, I know that you, know, you need to all focus first and foremost on your state and local health departments. Those reopening guidelines are going to provide you the kind of perspective that will help to minimize exactly the kind of liability that we're wanting to minimize. So ensure that your club is an A, entitled to reopen, and then B, obviously follow those state guidelines. But I think the most important thing with regard to a, a broad regional area like uh, uh, the, the DMV is that we all have to be aware that unfortunately we are not exempt from, we're exempt from a lot of things, but we're not exempt from the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. And most importantly, we're not exempt from what's called the General Duties Clause. And that can be found under 29 U.S.C. 654, subsection A. It's always great at one o'clock in the morning, in the afternoon, to talk about federal law. I know you're all excited about it. I am too. And that's where we need to look at 29 U.S.C. 654A. What is that general duties clause? Well, it's pretty straightforward. It says this, an employer shall furnish each employer, a, a, each worker, employment and work that is free from recognized hazards that are causing or likely to cause death or serious harm. Now, folks, that is COVID-19. So we understand now under OSHA's requirements that we have an obligation to provide a safe workplace, meaning the club, and safe work, meaning if I'm a server, I have to be safe in my work. 
If I do that, then I'm complying with OSHA. If I don't, then I'm in some significant trouble. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, just before I, uh, I was able to pass on this information to, uh, to Noel as we created these, this presentation, we, we found that there are 14,000 OSHA complaints that have been filed. And predominantly, they've been filed under the general duties clause. So please be aware that it's out there. The, the only good news that I can tell you is that right now OSHA is overwhelmed and they aren't actually going forward to really enforce these issues with employers. But we all know it's going to happen. So it is our responsibility, and, and there's not any one of us on this call who has a desire to be that person on the, you know, on the first click of Google that your club was hit with an OSHA violation because you failed to ensure the safety of your employees pursuant to OSHA. So it's out there, it's a concern, and we need to be aware. Additionally, you need to be aware that there are 22 states in the union that have actually provided their own OSHA requirements. Now they mirror what OSHA federally has done, but at the same time, you need to watch those as well. So keep that in mind. I've provided uh, some information in the presentation that allows you to go, it's a website, you can go and determine what your state requires uh, and if it does indeed have that OSHA outline guidance. And so not only do we have to deal with OSHA, maybe state OSHA, but also things like your state and local health departments, but we also have to understand that reasonableness will be the key when we deal with the other liability issue that's out there. And that's negligence liability. That's what I anticipate most clubs are going to be looking at if they have a claim filed against them. So how do we minimize that? Well, number one, we need to comply with CDC. And then number two, we need to comply with that state guidelines to help avoid that negligence claim. But most importantly, the key to all of this is one thing. What would a reasonably prudent person do in a similar circumstance? If we can convey that we're doing that, then we have an outstanding opportunity to be successful as we begin the process of actually opening up the club and moving forward. So I think that what we wanna do is ensure that we know what's best to protect us from OSHA, state OSHA, and negligence guidance. And Kate, we can move to the next one or you can provide me uh, the, the remote and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll take it that way. So the OSHA Occupational Safety and Health Administration control really is, thank you, uh, is ultimately about what the federal guidance and what the federal government has indicated when it starts to talk about how you take care of your employees, what you need to do and how you need to do it. Now, there are gonna be four steps that I want you to follow. The first one, I want you to develop a COVID-19 preparedness and response plan. Now, everyone here should be already on that road. If not, you're gonna be in a little bit of a bind as you begin reopening. Number one, I need you to task a senior staffer to head this and be responsible for all employee issues related to COVID-19. So what that means is you need to have probably, if it's not gonna be the general manager, it needs to be the assistant general manager. It needs to be someone who is senior enough and who now has the complete control, reins, carriage here, to ensure that you're moving in the right direction with regard to your response and preparedness plan. Secondly, let's determine the level of risk for each worker at the club. Now, the good news is most are gonna be low or medium risk employees based on their contact with others. We're not gonna be looking at high or very high risk individuals based on the simple fact that we're not in basically healthcare environments. And those are really where OSHA starts to look at high and very high levels of risk. So we're doing okay with regard to, to the risk. It's gonna be low, it's gonna be medium, but we also have to take into consideration individual workers factors. So I want you to take a moment, consider the age, if you've got employees who may be pregnant, who may have uh, chronic medical issues, those folks are in your higher risk categories. So it's important we work with those employees to minimize their potential exposure and therefore the, the potential damage that may be caused in the event that they do get COVID-19. Provide health screenings to employees before shifts. At the end of the day, when we talk about reasonableness, that's the key. There is no employee who's gonna walk into a facility, feel comfortable if he doesn't see the same kind of things that he or she is seeing on television in news reports with regard to businesses opening up. And that's what Noel's gonna spend some time uh, helping you work through as you look at how best to do that health screening. So taking that temperature, treating that information as confidential, but doing it and also doing it for your members. And we'll talk a little bit about that as well. And obviously we know about maintaining social distance. If you don't know that, you've been living under a rock, uh, so that's fine. Most importantly, please make sure that you put out appropriate signage throughout the club. So what I want you to do is understand that though you spent millions of dollars in redeveloping and remodeling the clubhouse or the restaurant, you need to incorporate some of that sort of style when you post those signs. I don't want you putting up a, a white sign that says, hey, you know, cover your mouth or uh, you know, wash your hands, but use some of the signage that's been 
present it and we'll provide you some, some websites that can get you those posters, but try and incorporate it in a way that makes it comfortable and enjoyable for your staff and for your members, but also from a legal perspective, it's gonna provide you safety and security because you're posting what you need to have members do and what you need to have employees do. So follow that, it's extremely important when we talk about how to minimize liability. Obviously establish those staggered shifts to ensure that you don't have employees come in at the same time. Continue your delivery of some services remotely, which means it's very good if you've got inside the administrative offices, folks who are doing this by remote, let them keep doing that. Even as we get more and more open, the less bodies we have inside the club, the better from a liability perspective. Obviously continue to cross train individuals in the event that you've got an outbreak so that you can have some of the maintenance of services that will be available even though the rest of the club may be closed or an individual employee may be sick and certainly continue to monitor federal, state, and in your case, uh, DC and local uh, departments of health to ensure that we're doing it correctly. All right, step number two, let's implement the basic infection uh, prevention measure. Now this is basic stuff, but it's extremely important. So we've got to promote and require frequent hand washing by our employees. That means the 20 second rule. And that means number one, wash your hands. Number two, wash your hands. Number three, rinse your hands. Number four, dry your hands. So it's, it's gotta be in that order. It, it sounds ridiculous that we have to sort of say it and say it and say it again, but it's the only way we can ensure and maintain some sort of sense of normalcy in this new norm. But more importantly, it's something that's going to then help us in the event we have any liability that's brought forward. In other words, we're able to show in every pre-staff meeting and every all staff meeting that we continue to remind our staff that they have to wash their hands frequently, not touch their face, that they need to ensure that they use hand sanitizers so that if anybody comes forward and makes a complaint, well, the first thing that's gonna be asked is, well, what's your training regimen to ensure that your staff understood how to do it? Well, we can't say, what do you mean? They wash your hands, it's not hard. It means, well, we tell them because at the beginning of every shift meeting, we tell them this is what they have to do, that they have to do it throughout the shift and they have to maintain this consistency with things like hand sanitizers. When we do that, it becomes a mantra at the club. It's a mantra at the club that helps protect us in the event there's a li liability. Provide and, and require use of face masks and gloves to minimize potential spread. Folks, there's no way around it. I know it may be uncomfortable for a lot of individuals, but from a liability prevention perspective, you cannot have a club run without masks. End of story. You just can't from an OSHA perspective and you certainly can't from a liability based on negligence perspective. It's gotta be there. And that means including your members. Now there are ways in which we can make that more palatable for your members. Uh, all of you know about the, the sort of hooks that are either for your Christmas stocking on your mantle or even for uh, uh, women's purses. When we have it at the bar, we've got opportunities where we can actually make that a little more attractive, have some sort of hook that an employee or a member rather can actually put his or her mask down when they're eating dinner. Well, that's, that's a way to make it a little more interesting, a little more exciting, but also that everybody understands you need to have your mask before you walk into the club. It saves employees and members from potential exposure. Obviously prohibit the sharing of workspaces. And I always tell this to my uh, country clubs uh, and golf clubs, please understand that, you know, it seems as though that this sounds like it's Joseph Stalin here, but it's one worker, one tool policy, end of story. If you've got a superintendent, this is his lawnmower, this, these are his tools, that's all he's gonna use, no one else is gonna use it. Same thing with regard to inside the staff, please understand that don't share phones, workspaces, computers, none of that. Everybody gets his or her own. If we don't have it, we need to find another way to do it. Obviously that means including sanitizing, but at this point, one worker, one tool policy. Maintain that routine cleaning for all surfaces and determine which are your frequently touched surfaces. Shouldn't be hard, we all understand what those things are from your doorknobs to surprise the carts. Uh, so make sure that we're continuing to do the kind of things necessary to disinfect those. Understand when I say routine, it's at least daily, but it could be more and it should be more for your frequently touched surfaces. Provide employees and members with those disinfecting wipes. If you can do it at the grocery store, we have to do it at the club. And clean with standard cleaners and then use EPA approved disinfectants for your frequently touched surfaces. Now, why do I say EPA? Well, because the CDC has said EPA. So here's the website, it's on the, the PowerPoint. Go to that site, look, it's still Lysol, it's still scrubbing bubbles, it's Johnson & Johnson, it's not difficult stuff, but the reality is, what do we have? An extra layer of protection that says, guess what? We've even gone to the EPA's website and purchased those kinds of things that were recommended from that site to disinfect to prevent against uh, COVID-19. That's important to say in the event some liability issues are brought forward. Again, we hope that there aren't gonna be those kinds of issues, 
But if they are, those are the kinds of things that help to, again, build up the foundation that we should be protected. Third, develop policies and procedures to keep the club healthy. Uh, you know, again, should be pretty straightforward at this point, but number one, educate your workers on COVID-19 symptoms. That means, do you have a cough? Shortness of breath, difficulty breathing. Those are your kickers right there. When you see it, you're, you know you're in trouble. Uh, additionally, at least two of the following, fever, chills, shaking with chills, muscle pain, sore throat, headache, or loss of taste and smell. And I understand how difficult it is when you've got those kinds of, let's just say nebulous uh, symptoms perspectives uh, from the CDC. Well, it is what it is. So when you've got individual employees who say, I've got a headache and a sore throat, send them home, period, send them home. Uh, understand that under the, the federal law, we were able to provide full pay for that individual, well, we're entitled to pay them uh, in the event that that individual is gone for the day. And we get full reimbursement for the compensation that we paid for that individual worker who's gone. So we've pr protected the club, protected the employee, and still paid the employee while getting that money directly returned to us from the federal government. So we lose nothing and it maintains safety and security inside the club. That's extremely important to see. So convey that to your members, make sure they understand that, hey, look, you are able to take a day off if you're sick to go find out if it is COVID, if it is a sore throat and a headache, if it's allergies or if it's COVID-19. So let's make sure that we encourage our employees to do that, obviously encourage them to self-monitor as well, but let them understand that we have an opportunity for them to take care of themselves even more because of this federal law. That satisfies OSHA and it satisfies our issues with regard to negligence. And again, try to be flexible with your leave policies if you can to make sure that workers can have their concerns met, not only through the federal uh, paid sick leave program, but also exactly how you've established. So we know that on the paid, uh, federal paid sick leave program, you've got for a full-timer 80 hours of paid sick leave. For a part-timer who's working, let's say 25 hours a week, over two weeks, that means he's got 50 hours. If you've got someone who's a server who has variable hours, you make the determination of what their two weeks is based on how many hours they've worked over the last six months. Uh, so the reality is we've got a, a truncated amount of time for many individuals. What we have to do is say to them, look, I know that the federal government's gonna provide you X amount of dollars. In essence, you're gonna have that paid sick leave for X number of hours, but I'm gonna help. So make sure that you do that because that minimizes potential liability from employees who are pursuing action under OSHA or your state OSHA requirements. That's really where our concern is gonna be with employees. So keep in mind that we wanna try and work and modify our policies to help meet their concerns for this limited amount of time while this pandemic is really running rampant. And obviously keep your members informed about symptoms and ask them to avoid them, tell them, not just ask, tell them to avoid the club if they show those symptoms. Look, if I can tell to an employee, I'm sorry, you've been drinking too much, you're gonna to have to go now. And indeed I have a legal right to do that and it's required. You can do the exact same thing with regard to someone who may be coming into the club, uh, coughing or have shortness of breath. So please ensure that your members understand for the safety of the club, they have to follow the same requirements that an employee would. I think the most important thing is work to improve the staff's mental health. And there are gonna be significant amount of questions with regard to things like lost pay, leave, safety, what you're doing at the club to protect them. So provide education and informational materials on proper hygiene, use of PPE, personal protective devices, make sure that they have things like social distancing in place, even in the back of the house with the staff, even in break rooms and that kind of a, a place. Please also make sure that the club's cleaning information and techniques are disseminated to your employees so they understand this is what you're doing, this is why we're doing it, and it's gonna make a difference so that they feel, again, more comfortable. At the end of the day, an informed worker, what? Feels more confident and they're less likely to be sick or to be absent from work. And that's really what we want to make sure of, is that they are going to be there, they're going to be happy to be there, and they're going to be confident when they're there. So at the end of the day, I think you need to sort of just keep in the back of your mind that ultimately an individual's comfort level is going to make the biggest issue, uh, is going to make the biggest difference for the club. All right, let's take a look at that fourth step, implement workplace controls. And this actually is really going to cover three areas that I think you can work the best with your own controls rather than sort of anything else. This is all about you. It's not just what your employees may think as you communicate with them. It's not the plan of preparedness or response plan. This is something you can actually touch and feel to make sure that you're making a difference. Number one, engineering controls. This deals with facilities. 
So utilize high efficiency air filters, open doors, increase ventilation rates, install those barriers with regard to plexiglass, either if it's in the kitchen or around uh, POS positions. Uh, at the end of the day, this is gonna be extremely important to help you show that you've done things that are, again, reasonable and appropriate with regard to this. Second, let's do administrative controls. Let's alter leave work uh, rules. Let's try and ultimately promote federal and state leave policies. Let's minimize contact between the workers and the members, stagger their shifts again, and again, offer those forms for, to, to answer employees' questions. If you do that, those administrative flows are gonna be really important, and those administrative controls are gonna make a difference as we talk about lowering the anxiety of individuals. And then third, protective, personal protective equipment, PPE controls, so gloves, face masks, and other PPE should be provided based on the risk of the individual employee. Now again, not only is it the risk factor, we know they're gonna be low and they're gonna be medium, but at the end of the day, it's what it will cause people to be comfortable, right? So we're talking about individuals who ultimately, who are what? I, if I'm walking in the club, I need to see gloves on individuals, I need to see masks on individual employees, and if I'm having the club open for anything, I need to make sure that my employees see that, that others are following these particular guidelines that make sense. And also understand that under OSHA, uh, they, those, those uh, uh, PPE all should be properly worn, regularly inspected, maintained, replaced, cleaned, and of course, be aware that you're obligated uh, to provide those to ensure that workers are indeed in a safe environment and doing their job safely. So just keep that in the back of your mind as you move forward with regard to how are we gonna implement this? How are we gonna make sure that we're doing what we need to do to protect our individual members? If we can do that, we're in a, a far better place uh, as we move forward. I think we can turn this back over now to uh, Noel. Actually, Kate can pass hey, it on to Noel. Brad, somebody had a question for you. Sure, why don't we do this, Kate, just to make sure that we keep moving along. If we can do it all at the end, because we're going to have some sure. time left over, that probably would be best to, to okay, do. Okay, we'll go ahead and do that then. So, Kate, so we'll pass it on to Nola to, to knock it out of the park with regard to, again, what I think the most important aspects of this is what we minimize liability is to make sure that we start with screening our employees when they walk in, and indeed our members as well. So what do we want to do? We want to move forward and make sure that those employees understand that we're doing everything for them as we can which means screening, and that means, of course, temperatures. And I know, Noel, you can move forward. Uh, yeah, we're gonna take a look at exactly how best to do that using the technology that's out there. Brad, thank you very much. Those were all great points. And, you know, what prompted us to put this together was when I, you know, heard, you know, Brad going down through all those points, you know, I've been getting calls from general managers for the past six or eight weeks in different parts of the country, like New York, Connecticut, New Jersey, um, Baltimore, <laughs> Chevy Chase, um, Florida, Texas, California, Missouri, you know, asking like, how are we going to, you know, we're having these issues with temperatures. And, you know, um, in the past, when I saw this, you know, general duty clause where, you know, in a workplace free from hazards, causing or likely to cause death. I mean, I've never been involved in that until COVID-19. And now there's technology, you know, challenges that can help clubs, you know, so, you know, better mitigate this. And, you know, there's one metric that the CDC gives us is temperatures. So there's a thing called thermal cameras that can take temperatures. And we've helped a lot of clubs um, with security camera systems and access controls over the past five or six years. And so I started getting calls from the GMs we work with, uh, you know, saying, hey, will this camera work um, to help us with our, you know, uh, take temperatures for our staff and members? Uh, so we started digging into it a bit and, you know, how do we take temperatures today? Well, um, there's basically four ways that I see is there's no testing, which is okay. Um, there's the handheld, you know, um, devices, which are, you know, generally a hundred to $200. That's where we started in March and April and quickly started getting calls that, you know, they didn't work very well. You know, the issues were, you know, they stopped working or period of days, they weren't accurate. The worst part was, was a one-to-one relationship where you put, you know, the, the thermometer to somebody's head, were you exposing your staff to COVID-19? You know, and so, you know, again, was it worth taking temperatures? It's, you know, it's almost like, you know, checks and balances, good and bad types of things. And then the last thing is, should we be supplying PPE for our staff? And if so, what sort of standards would there be? So, you know, you kind of look at all these challenges 
and, and just to clarify to everybody, neither Brad and I sell anything. So I don't sell hardware, software. I, you know, to me, that's a conflict of interest. So the goal of this was just, you know, here's what GMs around the country are struggling with when it comes to these OSHA issues. And is there this technology that could help us potentially reduce liability? The second way to take temperatures, um, and this is a better way, is a kiosk style device. And this is, you know, moderately priced. And, you know, you put it there and the person comes in and it takes their temperature. Um, I think there's some challenges with this. And, you know, this was an email I put together for a GM last week. My goal was to really give you, here's real facts. Here's what your peers are dealing with. So we went back and forth on some of the pros and cons of the kiosk style. You know, and my, these were my bullet points. Again, this is talking to GMs, you know, across the country on can this work for us? And so if you notice some of those, and we'll be glad to share this presentation with you. You know, I know there's a bunch of information here, but if you, you know, um, it's again, it's a, it's a standalone device. You don't really have anybody monitoring. So if you register a temperature, uh, what's the process for coming onto the property or, you know, being asked to leave the property? Uh, I actually think, you know, a couple more bullet points now. I think this is going to be, you know, good for Main Street restaurants where you have, have you know, um, potential guests coming in. You have a host, host stand there you know, next to the host stand, people look at it, they're past their temperature, you have some sort of check and balance there. But again, I think it's exposing the person, you know, and so uh, key apps, conceptually this would work, I just see some challenges. Um, a good example um, would be uh, with a thermal camera. And so thermal cameras can take, you know, a, a wider area of um, images and for a number of people uh, without getting close to it. And, you can have four or five people access that camera remotely without standing there. Uh, but one of the challenges with a thermal camera is could you put it like a, a, a gate entrance? And so take some, you know, the, you know a, a number of the GMs were like, hey, I have a front gate. Can I put this camera here and take temperatures as members come in? Well, the issue is, is the temperature of the engine, you know, can affect the reading of the temperature of the person. So there's a lot of different factors that go into this. So what I thought I would do is kind of talk about what is thermal imaging and how does it work? And then how are clubs actually using this? So in its basic terms, it's, you know, it's kind of like a heat scale. It gives you from purple, blue, which is cooler to the red, orange, and um, uh, that are higher temperatures. Um, you know, the colder temperatures are often shades of blue, purple, and green. Warmer is yellow, orange, and red. You know, and so how does it work? You know, so it has different, you know, there's different metrics that associate, you know, the cameras have built in readers that say this temperature goes to, you know, a, a darker color or a lighter color, you know, and all objects emit an infrared radiation signal. So whether it's a cat or dog or a person, you will get a thermal reading. Um, we were actually using thermal cameras back in November and December in a club in Florida. And they had asked us to help them with their beach line. So they had a lot of beach property where they were concerned that could, you know, guests come in from the beach, um, you know, or could a boat pull up and just people walk in. And again, this is going to happen, you know, in the, in the daytime, we had cameras out there that could see, but at night, there's very little light. So we started putting thermal cameras to augment um, who was coming in and out of that property line. Now, we weren't taking temperatures, but we could clearly see that you know, a person was coming in versus a, you know, a dog or a cat. So I thought it'd be helpful to show you like, what's this scale look like? And so as you can see on the left, uh, you have like the purple, the blues, the light blues, which are cooler temperatures. And then the red, you know, yellow, orange, which are higher temperatures. And so how a camera, thermal camera works, if you'll notice, here's the cooler temperatures that are associated with, you know, lower temperatures. And then here's the red, the yellow, and the oranges colors that are higher temperatures. So, you know, again, these cameras work. They do do, you know, they are able to tell you that a person has a temperature. And, you know, how would a thermal camera help a private club? You know, and so that's really what it's going to come down to. You know, it's a, it's a very, you know, it, it can scan a big area pretty quickly. Um, it can tell you um, who's coming in, who's coming out. Um, it's pretty simple and convenient to operate. 
And I have some examples further down of what the actual pictures look like of this. And the clubs have said it's okay to use these um, pictures. Um, so I think those are some you know helpful ways. Uh, so it's the ability to take temperatures from a, a, a large distance. You know the consumer grade thermometers are ineffective. Um, the best part of a thermal camera is multiple people can access it. So you could have somebody down in your HR department looking at this camera that's at your employee entrance. You know, or you know you can have a number of people, and additionally, it can record to your security camera system. So you you know however long your archive is. You know, we're connecting these cameras to record so we could go back two and three days. So can we see, you know, um, what happened uh, a week ago? Did somebody come in with a temperature? You know, Brad, do you think that, you know, thermal cameras are part of, so, you know, to help augment some of the OSHA requirements? Yeah, I mean, they certainly can and, and they will absolutely provide some sense of protection. The key with everyone is understanding that at the end of the day, we can't have that false sense of security. So we wanna make sure that we do everything we can to sort of cross the T's and dot the I's as best as possible to ensure that what we're getting is an accurate determination of what each individual employee has in terms of temperature reading. So these are, these are good places to start without a doubt, uh, and they all go to doing what we have to do, and that is to provide, again, a safe workplace and safe work for those individual employees. Yeah, and so the last part is, is you know, ability to provide a positive negative temperature in a fast-paced environment. Seems like the screen's not moving here. We've lost. Do you have the connection or? It, it shows that you're controlling it. So I don't. Oh, there we go. So what's a thermal camera look like? It's interesting because it's actually two cameras in one. So on the left side, you have a high resolution, you know, two megapixel camera, which will give you a clear view of who's coming and going. On the right side, you have that thermal camera, which will be more of that blurry image with the red, yellow, greens. So I thought it'd be helpful to see what a camera actually looked like. Seems to be going really slow here. Okay, and so here's kind of some of the specs, but what I thought was interesting was the application scenario down here at the bottom. And so as I started looking at these cameras, I was like, wow, airports, train stations, office buildings, you know, where aren't you going to be taking temperatures? Uh, it just was the, the range of businesses, you know, regardless of being a private club, I was, who's going to use these things? Um, you know, so I think that it's something, you know, as you look at the, the second last, or the last piece there at the bottom is companies, you know, so I thought that was, it, it really, it, the size of who's using these, it, it's a kind of interesting. Seems like the something's happened to slow down the slideshow, Kate. Sorry about that. Weird. I must have keep hitting it to go forward, but it won't. Not sure what happened. Hello? What did we lose, Kate? She's there, although we did lose uh, the, the PowerPoint. So Kate, maybe you want to take control again, and pop that back up to show your screen. Sorry about that, everybody. Must have got a bad internet connection. And you're on mute, uh, Kate. Sorry about that. I'm getting it going. Super. No, I think you're right, though, no, that there is a, 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 an indeed a, a strong desire to ensure that we have that kind of information. Uh, and if we do, uh, we're going to be better off. This is a good way to do it. So uh, let's hope that uh, this becomes more of the norm for private clubs. Or it's a tool, right? You know, there's, you know, it's, 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 you know, one of the things I found interesting was it's not a silver bullet. You know, we're kind of learning as we go, but certainly it, it, you know, we have seen this. It has a lot of parameters that it we records the temperatures and we'll show you here. Um, 
Uh, do I have control, Kate, or do you? And Kate, you can you can advance it. I think while I'm while has got that. Or if you want, okay. So some of the benefits um, of the, the thermal cameras it protects the staff and vendors. Um, it provides you know vendors and members. We can create these immunity cards. And I'm going to show you some examples of that. But by far and away, is it's going to reduce liability. You know, that you have the ability to say, you know, what else can you say? You know, to the lawsuits that Brad talked about earlier, you know, here's a tool we put in to measure temperatures for the employees. Here's a tool we put in to measure the temperatures uh, of the members. You know, what other things could we have been doing uh, that made sense? And we recorded the information. We created reports on a daily basis about who we, you know, uh, check their temperatures. And oh, by the way, we set the temperature at about 100 degrees. So 104 is considered a temperature. And I've seen four or five clubs, and I've read some articles in the papers about restaurant openings. Seems that about 100 degrees is the temperature. But, um, uh, yeah, CDC requires 100.4 is the sort of the cutoff. So we want to keep it within that range. And you can do that with these. So I think one of the interesting aspects that, uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. One of the interesting is aspects with regard to all this is quite simply that what we're trying to avoid is having someone step forward and say, look, you violated my rights. You've killed me in many different ways. Uh, and uh, I'm going to pursue action against you. And what do we have to worry about with regard to OSHA? Well, number one, we need to worry about the penalties. Obviously, willful and repeat violations may be fined up to $5,000 to $70,000 per violation. Serious violations shall be fined up to $7,000 per violation. But what is a serious violation? Well, it's a substantial probability that death or serious physical harm could result from the violation unless the employer did not and could not, with the exercise of reasonable diligence, know of the presence of the violation. Well, here's our problem. Our problem is we know about this and we didn't do everything. It's COVID, right? We, we know it's out there. So we certainly understand that this is an issue that we have to take seriously. We know that it can provide up to death. Obviously, serious physical harm can result from it. So we cannot violate OSHA requirements based on the fact that we would be falling into a serious violation potential claim. Non-serious violations, they can be fined up to $7,000 per violation as well. And failure to correct any violation, thankfully OSHA will provide you some time to fix something. That's good, but failure to do that, guess what we have? We've got some uh, about $7,000 per. So we know this. We know that at the end of the day, our biggest concern is quite literally having to deal with OSHA. And why do we have to worry about OSHA? Well, it's not just because of the OSHA violations, as I mentioned with 14,000 outstanding claims, they're not immediately jumping on this. But here's our problem. Our problem is that a violation of OSHA or a violation of state OSHA requirements or of CDC guidelines provides you what? Significant liability with regard to negligence. So what is negligence? Duty of care, breach of that duty, proximate cause, and damages. Those are the elements of negligence. I think for us, our key element is going to be did we breach the duty of care? Now, we know we have a duty of care to our employees and to our members. That shouldn't be a question. We know proximate cause means that because of what I did immediately caused the injury, that the connectivity certainly between uh, I didn't clean the glass as well, I didn't have things like thermal imaging, I didn't take temperatures of employees who therefore could have been sick and given it to me, there's an obvious connection. The proximate cause element should be satisfied. And indeed, damages, that's going to be dependent upon what is actually the cost. What was the injury uh, turning into for those who were sick. So at the end of the day, our biggest concern is going to be breach of that duty. So we know we're going to have difficulty with the other three, but the breach, the breach is where we have the benefit. And ultimately, how do we take advantage of that benefit? Well, we have to do what a reasonably prudent person would do in a similar situation. We go back if we could one. So the reality is that I think that's, that's going to be our focus point, right? Our focus is going to be ensuring that what we do is what a reasonably prudent person would do. So if we're not successful with regard to it, then we've got to deal with damages that include actual damages, pain and suffering for negligence, up to, God forbid, wrongful death claims. So we know that that's going to be there. So how do we minimize it, tamp it down, do what a reasonably prudent person would do, which means make sure that we have those screening requirements and, and mechanisms in place to provide that, that again, that, that prophylactic, that protection for our club and for our employees. Follow OSHA, follow the CDC, follow the state and local guidelines, in any step of the, of the line here, as long as we have an opportunity to say we've done what OSHA is required or maybe even more, we've done what CDC has indicated with regard to the number of individuals that we have at the club. We shouldn't have gatherings larger than 10 right now, right? 
So at the end of the day, when we start to talk about all of that, we start talking about what we're doing and how we're doing it, guess what? That, that really provides us with an understanding that we're doing everything that we need to do that a reasonably prudent person would do. So it really is about following these guidelines and really providing a little more. And as Noel talked about, using IT to do that is gonna help you tremendously. What about business liability immunity? We've heard about this sort of thrown around from Congress. Uh, and, and I gotta say, really the place in which it's being done the most is in the states. Uh, and we've got about eight states right now that have provided business liability in some way, form, or fashion. Uh, but from the congressional side, from a, a national perspective, right now what we have, we've got Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, who's made it clear that he wants it in the next congressional coronavirus response bill. And we've got Minority Leader Chuck Schumer, who's made it clear that he doesn't want it. So there, there will be obviously a, a need for a little more negotiation with regard to, to us getting a federally passed business immunity protection. Uh, that's not there now, though the states, not in Maryland, not in Virginia, not in D.C., but the states are stepping up in the absence of federal action. So at the end of the day, uh, when we go back one, if we can, at the end of the day, we know that that's exactly where we're looking. We're looking for an ability for us to continue to have business liability, at least in the discussion. If that business liability immunity in the discussion can be brought forward more, we're going to have some more success. Right now, I want you to understand it's actually no longer 800, it's now 1,300 lawsuits that have been filed. So please keep in mind it's out there, and I would anticipate, again, we can do what we need to do with regard to our employees, lowering their anxiety level and doing the kinds of things with regard to the show that we are doing everything appropriate as a reasonably prudent person would do. I think our employees are going to be okay with us. The question, though, then becomes our members and whether we've done everything we need to do to cover their comfort uh, so that they are, are not inclined to pursue negligence claims against us. Let's talk a little bit about liability waivers. Please understand you're still going to have suits, and those suits are going to come forward based on the fact that they've got questions of the viability of those waivers. For members, it may be difficult to have them do a, a, a waiver simply because of a couple of things. Number one, they just may balk at it. Uh, you're going to have 90% of your members who may say that's fine, but they're going to be 10% who just say, I'm not interested in doing that. Uh, I'm not going to right away waive my rights to pursue action if I get sick here. And also, it's going to be hard to exclude your members if they have complied with the membership agreement, paid their dues, and there isn't something inside that membership agreement. Now, there should be, but isn't something inside that membership agreement that indicates any rules or regulations promulgated by the board in, is to be included uh, with regard to requirements to follow the membership agreement. Most clubs have that. If you don't have that sort of clause or that ability to do so, you're going to have an issue. So please keep that in mind with regard to liability waivers from your members. With regard to your staff, I strongly suggest you're not going to be successful there. Number one, staff can't waive their rights to federal requirements, benefits that they're given, like a safe workplace and OSHA requirements. And number two, the real question is, is that waiver going to be seen as something that they signed under duress? Uh, so as an example, if I'm unemployed, I'm on unemployment, I'm brought back, but the only way that I actually get to start my job back up is if I sign the waiver. And if I don't sign the waiver, most state laws in the District of Columbia will indicate that you, know, you voluntarily resign from a job if you don't accept it. And as such, you do not get to have unemployment any longer. Therefore, the reality is, if I, the employee, sign on the dotted line for the waiver, Am I doing that based on the fact that I got no other choice? Uh, I'm not going to be able to take care of my family because I can't get back on unemployment. So I had to sign the waiver. I think that's going to be a question. Again, duress is not something we want to deal with. I would suggest that we do things like post in the club. Hey, look, you're using the facilities at your own risk, understanding the, the, the ability for COVID-19 to be transmitted so easily that we're doing the best that we can. However, you are assuming that risk. I don't have a problem with regard to that being out there. I don't have a problem with regard to you utilizing that kind of language with regard to email communication. And in, in the event that you decide to come back to the club, we're happy to reopen. But please understand that you're doing so at your own risk. Uh, and obviously, we'd much rather have something signed. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's at least an opportunity for you to try and minimize that liability in some way, shape, or form. But at the end of the day, the best way you limit, limit that liability is by following the basic reasonableness perspectives make sure that you comply with OSHA and make sure that you utilize technology as best you can. That's exactly what this presentation really, I think, has provided you a good basis to do so. Uh, and once that happens, uh, we're going to be in the right kind of situation. No, I'll turn it back over to you to, to show exactly how you'd roll these out in terms of thermal cameras. Thanks, Brad. That was very helpful. And so now you kind of have um, this ability of 
you know, how are clubs choosing to roll out these cameras? You know, and there's, there's a couple different ways you can, you know, I, I think the first focus would be um, to, to focus on your staff and vendors. And so usually they're the main entrance and part of this is changing some of the process. Kate, are you, did you pass control over or? So phase one would be, you know, pre-opening staff and vendors. Phase two would be post-opening member screening. So what you want to try to do is find a couple areas where, you know, you can control like in the, what I've seen other clubs do is um, in their kitchen where their time clocks are, most staff come into this one entrance to clock in or out. So a camera there makes sense. Same thing for, um, you know, the members. There's, you know, we're gonna have to change some process. You know, we, clubs have a lot of entrances and doors. So um, unfortunately this is, you know, it's not normal. Um, and so what, you're, what are you able to do is um, create these concepts called immunity cards. And so other clubs are actually using these. Um, in this case, we're using uh, their smartphone app. Uh, this one's called Paysetter. And within that app, you can have a staff app and a member app. So our members are already in there, the staff's already in there. You can create um, a member card or a staff card. And you know, by looking at the cameras, you can pretty quickly, since you have three or four people accessing them, you can see that they passed their temperature. Now, one of the things that Brad had brought up um, in another session was, you probably have to do this per shift. Um, you know, Brad, is that something you think would be a good idea? Oh yeah, I mean, I, you know, these are. Uh, it's great to sort of have that as a as a comfort level, but at the end of the day, we're going to have to make sure that those individuals are indeed cleared each and every time they are in the building. And I would strongly suggest that during breaks, we might want to take a look again as well. It should be an easy and simple way for us to take a, a temperature. Look, we all understand the CDC has sort of said now, maybe fever isn't a good indicator. But at the end of the day, again, we have to go through that process of doing things that convey that we take this seriously, we understand the issues, and we're doing all we can as a reasonable reasonable person would do. So that's a way to do it. But just having a once uh, every 24 hours isn't going to cut it, I think, from a liability perspective. But at least it's, this provides a, another way for us to sort of prove we're doing what we need to do. Yeah, and here's a better example, too. So you can see there's, there's an immunity card approach where, you know, green is good, red, you know, time to go home. But, you know, it's within the same app, you know, we can go and, you know, look at all the members. And if you look on the right side, I'm sorry if this was kind of small, I tried to make it bigger, but you can have, you know, on the green, it says, you know, passed uh, and the red is not registered. You know, so Brad, I think this would be another good way that you could every day print out one of these, have a record. Again, from a liability standpoint, you're able to say to, you know, um, you know, on your defenses, you know, these are the things we're doing. We spent money on this. We made process, you know, what else could we have done? What other guidelines could we have followed? You know, and so I think both having the ability to look at a, at a uh, membership card. The thing with a membership card is good is oftentimes a private club is the golf shop is, you know, not attached to the main clubhouse. The fitness center isn't attached. So you have to go to different parts um, of the club to get in and, you know, just, that immunity card comes on your smartphone. So, you know, when you go in, you know, check in the golf, you can show them that, hey, you passed the temperature check. You know, and so here's actually what these cameras look like. And if you can see up in the left-hand column, that person registered a 97.3 temperature. Uh, you know, so, you know, if you also notice here on the, in the middle here, in the, there's a, there are sensors on the other side of the camera by the door. So this is a real club where this has gone in, you know, and you can see that there's what we were talking about earlier. There's two cameras. Here's what the view of the one camera looks like. that's taking the temperature and here's the two megapixel high resolution camera. So you can really see, you know, okay, who was that? And if you notice here in the middle, there's this black box. That's, you know, help taking the recordings uh, and measurements, but you can see kind of the red, you know, orange, um, of the camera, you know, and this is kind of a parameter setting. Again, you know, I don't know if you can see that, but it says of a hundred degrees right there. And so, I, again, I think that's a good, you know, um, safe setting that you're not right at the 104. And so if somebody's registering hundred and, you know, somebody could be running outside and register a higher temperature, 
I get that, you know, it's not going to be, you know, 100%, you know, um, reliable. There are going to be some exceptions to the rule, but, you know, what's the, you know, again, from a defensive position liability, if we were able to get 90%, you know, you know, on a, any given day or 97, 98, you know, we do have to, you know, there has to be a variable in there that, you know, a temperature reading could be misinterpreted. You know, so again, you know, what I, want, I thought was interesting about this, if you notice this table here, the middle in, uh, between these two doors, what we're, what we're seeing is there's a traffic flow, you know. So again, we have these technologies, but it's more than just technology. It's not a magic wand or a silver bullet. You have to, you know, you have to have your hat off, your, you know, sunglasses are a problem. Um, but also, in this case, we had to put a table between this door because people would dart to the right just as they came in. So the camera has to get a view of their face for like two seconds. So the, the, the point of this slide is it's not a perfect world and we certainly can't make it a perfect world. So we have to be flexible and make adjustments to make the technology work with you know, the setup of how traffic flow works today. So I hope that makes sense. But again, you can come up with common sense, practical you know, solutions to these problems. So that being said, you know, I know there was a question from Brad earlier. Uh, we certainly hope you have questions. Uh, you know, it's been a kind of an interesting two to three weeks of, you know, what are kind of your choices of not only with OSHA, but how do you try to, you know, regardless of being a club, how do you try to open a business and not get some huge you know, lawsuits? Yeah, it's going to be a very interesting time as, as clubs deal with everything. Obviously, you all are, are, are going through quite a lot to begin the process, so I'm happy to answer any questions. I know no will uh, be as well. Uh, I think, Kate, you had one that was out there. I think Kate's still yeah. there. So uh, it says, when a staff member shows signs of fever, shortness of breath, et cetera, and we send them home, are we obligated to notify the membership what is the best what is the best practice? Yeah, you're going to have to first make a determination of where, where was that employee. So if the employee is just coming in right now, so hasn't had a problem yesterday, you know, utilizing the immunity card or whatever, uh, at the end of the day, that employee was fine. But if they're coming here, she's coming in that day, then the reality becomes, all right, I, I know what I've had. I've got an individual who I'm sending home because this individual has exhibited symptoms. The question then becomes, where was the individual yesterday? So if the individual was employed, working for the club at that time, and had now obviously today he's exhibited symptoms but didn't before, it would be advisable to do a couple of things. Number one, yes, we want to make sure that we have anyone around that individual notified. We want to notify and, and clean that a person's area, wherever he or she was. If it's a staffer who's working in the administrative offices, it's a heck of a lot easier than if it is if it happens to be an employee who may be working in the restaurant or uh, working in the pro shop. So it's going to depend on where the individual was and the kind of exposure the individual had. This could conceivably shut down the club. So we're going to have to do our best to figure out where and when that person was at the club. And then from there, make, take the next step to determine exactly who should be notified. If it was someone who's around everybody, or at least had an opportunity to be, or was at least in an area that others may have been around, then, then we've got an issue of disclosure. But more importantly, things like cleaning, disinfecting, uh, but obviously that employee is not coming in that day. So we, we do have an issue. That's why it's so important that we at least every single day, at least once a day, have that opportunity to take a temperature, do that, make sure the individuals have those uh, self-screening at home, but also make sure that we do it at the club. And at that point, you know, depending upon where an employee was, uh, we may be looking at shutting down the club at least for 14 days or while an individual then gets tested. Obviously remind that individual employee that they are then now able to be paid have them go to their doctor, have them get tested. Tests are obviously based on when need is there. And at the end of the day, this is a good opportunity for them to get that test. Hopefully we get a negative uh, and from there, it doesn't affect the operations of the club, but that's part of the preparedness and response plan, right? So what happens in the event I've got an employee who's sick? Well, you, you can't continue to run the club if I knew that a server or a kitchen staff member got sick or exhibited the symptoms. So from a liability perspective, you need to find out from whence he or she has come, right? Where was he or she? Uh, and then from there, you'll have to make some determinations. Yeah, and Not a fun scenario, on, but one that we all have to sort of deal with. And to add on to that, you know, if there's reporting, you should be able to go back and see that employees the last three, four days or one, you know, they're not coming every day, but 
every other day, you know, can you go back and see two or three days ago that they came in without a temperature or at least a lower temperature for sure. But I our key that, is this, that at the end of the day, no employee should be on staff unless the employee has not exhibited symptoms, including fever uh, for that day. So uh, while it's always nice to have a record with that information, understand we've got to deal with confidentiality requirements. We don't have HIPAA ob obligations. So please do not worry about HIPAA. We have ADA requirements. Private clubs are exempt from the ADA if you're truly private. And we can talk about that if we need to. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, I just keep in mind that right now there's an exemption under the ADA's mandates with regard to communicating things that are confidential. So we have the opportunity to do this, and as long as we have an opportunity to take the temperatures, we're perfectly, perfectly fine. But we still want to make sure that we keep that confidential. So as we talk about recording, uh, you know, and maintaining a, a running log of an employee's health and screening uh, uh, results, just keep in mind I don't want to have a lot of that information out there because we don't want to have a question of confidentiality presented. But at the same time, uh, you know, again, every individual comes in. We are going under the supposition the individual is fine if he or she meets this pre-screening requirement before they step foot into the facility. And that's the key. Okay, we have any others that popped up? Uh, Kate? There's a follow-up to that and it says people can get sick for a variety of reasons. Are we obligated to let the members know when they leave or when they are tested positive? Yes, absolutely. Look, at the end of the day, you can't just sort of step back and say, well, I don't want anybody to know, so I'm going to just keep it hush-hush, wink-wink, nobody's going to know. Absolutely not, not in this day and age and not with regard to the liability that can come. So if I have an employee who tests positive or if I have an employee who's sent home, that's what I have to do. I've got to take a look, where was the employee? If he's tested positive before he stepped into the club, I, that's no, there's no issue. That's the point of us doing it outside. The moment he steps inside the club, where was he? Where did he go? With whom did he come into contact? So that's what we need to know with regard to the job description of where this employee is. Obviously, we're going to have a lesser number of employees in the club based on the fact that we have to maintain or need to try to maintain social distancing. So we know where he's been, and know with whom he's come into contact. In the event that an individual is sick or does test positive, again, we need to know where that employee was because it's going to determine whether we shut the whole club down or indicate to a, you know, a small number of individuals and disinfect an area. This is where he came into contact. This is all that it's encountered. It was inside the, the accounting department. So we've closed that area off, we've disinfected that area, those folks who were there are now gone, we've, we've had them go home to self-quarantine, but it's just gonna depend. But we can't keep it quiet. I mean, understand that if you have an individual employee who is sick, gets sick during work or is sick coming in, we've gotta know where he or she was inside the club because if I've got an older member in surprise, most of us had older members who happens to be at the club, that we place that individual club member in jeopardy and any family member that that individual may be around. So it is imperative that we, number one, ensure our members, our staff, understand the symptoms and self-quarantine if they see that they're coughing or they have a fever or they have a sore throat, et cetera. Remind them that they have an ability to do this because the federal law has provided federal paid sick leave money. And then we know, all right, well, if they're coming to work and they have a symptom that's shown, First thing we're gonna do, send them home, get them paid, but direct them to their medical professional so that they can begin the process of determining whether it's a positive or a negative. But that's, that's what we have to do. So it, it's, there, there is no keeping this from our membership and no keeping this from our other employees. If we do, we're, exerted, we're, we're potentially providing a significant amount of liability for the club, uh, not only from an OSHA perspective, but also from a, a negligence liability perspective. And you know, that's where I think having those strong checkpoints at the member, entrance and the staff vendor entrance it's going to be critical because if you can stop them there from going into the restaurant um, it's gonna you know again you got to clean all those areas uh, and if you know when you stop them right at the you know the point of you know checkpoint um, you, you know you only have to clean that area and be you know before mm -hmm. uh, so it's going to you know the, the time to potentially be shut down or closed could be greatly reduced yeah very much so. I think we got time for maybe one more, Kate. I think you're on mute. Hello. Um, I don't see any more questions in the uh, Q&A screen. I see one here. Uh, do the thermal cameras or even taking temps of employees or members give a false sense of security with the number of asymptomatic people? 
Do you think yeah. wearing masks, sanitizing, washing hands, and maintaining social distance are better measures of protection? Well, they're not better, but they're certainly equal too. So we, we still want to take the temperature. We still want to utilize the technology that's out there, but you're absolutely correct. Obviously, that's what CDC has indicated when they've sort of stepped away from fever being the key, the almighty sort of this is exactly what we have to watch for. So asymptomatic members uh, and, and employees, you know, there's your, uh, there's your $64 million question, right? Uh, is who's got it because they don't know it. Uh, at the end of the day, that's exactly why we want to use PPE, why that's going to protect the club more so. But having those kinds of things like using th thermometers, infrared cameras, uh, thermal cameras, all of that is just going to go to, again, building a foundation that says we've done what a reasonably prudent person would do. But you're right. At the end of the day, that may only get a third of those who may be sick because of asymptomatic perspective. I don't see that any other questions have come in since. And I think <clears throat> so, no, we did such a good job. We answered everything. You answered everything right on time. Outstanding. How did that happen? Wait a minute. That's not right. <laughs> that's something. I saw Pat King on here. Pat clearly just doesn't want to ask a question because we're over at two o'clock. That's what you're doing. I see that. You do tell me, Patrick Toby. I see you. <laughs> so we'll give what? Nope. <laughs> nope. Nope. Everybody's keeping their mouth shut. Good for them. That's good. Well, I know it's <laughs> no, been a pleasure for talking. me to, to spend some time. I know, uh, I know, Noel, it's been a, a joy for you. Thank you for, uh, for inviting me. Kate, thank you for hosting today. Hopefully it's been helpful. Obviously, if I can do anything else with anyone, because I'm certainly around here, I'm, I'm uh, much more accessible uh, in terms of uh, ease. So don't hesitate to give me a buzz. I'll answer any questions if you have. And I know Noel will do, Noel will do the exact same. Yeah, hopefully that was helpful. You know, again, we want to, you know, here's what your peers are going through with this issue. And you know, it's, it's interesting. I, you know, six months ago, if you would have said this was a hot topic, I would have, you know, shaken my head and said no. But, you know, the issue is, is there's really no tools you can use for this, or there's few tools we can use. And I think, you know, Brad's point earlier is, you know, we're trying to use the tools that, you know, the CDC says we can, you know, use to keep our facility safe and make sure that there are, you know, nobody's going to be, you know, get sick and die at the property. So I think that, you know, Kate, thank you very much for letting us uh, put this together for the Absolutely. chat. Absolutely, thank you so much for sharing your time and your expertise with us. We really appreciate it. Um, is, if it's okay with you, I'll go ahead and share the slide deck. And oh, the no, don't do that. <laughs> um, I'll archive it on the website. And um, so any of our members will be able to access it after right. the fact. And then just as a housekeeping item, everyone that was registered and on this webinar will get one um, activity credit. So I'll go ahead and submit that to CMAA. And so I think that's it for today. Thank you again so much, Brad and Noel, for being with us. Thank you, and you all take care, stay safe. We'll look forward to getting to your clubs, at least I will, pretty soon. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks, Kate. Bye. Thanks, Noel. Good job.